Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris, and we are back with another installment of Going Over With Winning In Mind by Lanny Basham. If you guys remember, we left off at page 73. We're about to talk, we're about to finish uh, this chapter on the conscious circle. And then eventually, probably next time, we're going to move into the subconscious circle and building that up. Um, some things that we talked about last time were rehearsal, uh, visualization, uh, how to write goals. I gave you guys a sample on how I write goals. And maybe maybe once at the conclusion of this series, I, I'll give you guys a more thorough breakdown than I did. Uh, in that video, in that particular video. But today, pages 73 through 105 of With Winning in Mind, let's just kick things off. The three phases of a task. And when Lanny was going through this in the book, it, this is where parts of the book get very like athletic specific. And this right here is a perfect example, perfect example of it. Anticipation phase, action phase, and the reinforcement phase of a task. And he uses the example of golf in this. Uh, he uses an example of shooting. Lots of athletic examples in this. Um, having said that, let's let's go go over this. The three phases of a task: the anticipation phase. This is your conscious mind, what you think about immediately before you perform. So in the golf example, this is what you are thinking about before your actual golf shot, before you even line up for the shot, right? Could be the environment, like uh, the scope of the course in front of you, your target, something like that. Then you move into the action phase. This is what you think about as you perform. In this phase, you probably do not want to get too, use too much of your conscious mind, right? This is where in the action phase, you want your subconscious to kind of take over a little bit here. And then finally, you have the reinforcement phase. This is what you think about immediately after you perform that certain task and whenever you talk about a bad performance you increase the chances of having another one so after a shot after some athletic movement you want to, after like let's say you're bowling or a pool shot something like that you don't want to dwell on if it if the shot goes bad you don't want to dwell on it for long you want to have a short memory when it comes comes to negative things. But if, if the shot goes where you want it to, well, then you got to reinforce that to make sure that that same task, that same event happens again. So he calls this uh, running a mental program, right? You have a certain certain list of steps that you do before you attempt any sort of a shot, any sort of like athletic endeavor, etc. You run this mental program every time, every time before you get another rep in. Because the name of the game is being consistent. And the person who's the most consistent will, will have a I don't know if they'll win every single time, but they're going to have a good performance as long as they are positively consistent in that right direction. The inconsistency comes from the environment. That comes from the environment, letting the environment kind of take over and dictate your performance versus something that you pre-program in your mind. And the good thing about a mental program is it, it gets you consistency into your your performance and then outside of your performance. If you have this program running before and after, 
it's going to help everything in between in that athletic event or or whatever event it is, right? Lana gives a lot of athletic examples, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an athletic example. So what Lanny says about this mental program is that you run this mental program to trigger the subconscious to then perform the appropriate action. So here's just some criteria that Lanny lays out for the mental program. So a mental program must occupy the conscious mind. It gives the conscious mind something to think about so the conscious mind is not constantly dwelling on the environment, looking around, and getting distracted. You know, you want your conscious mind to stay loose. Also, the trans there has to be a transfer of power to the subconscious mind, right? So you want to go from the conscious mind to your subconscious mind. That's where all your skill set is going to be, right, that you've practiced and practiced and nailed down in your training sessions. The mental program has to be du duplicable, duplicatable, duplicable, uh, which means it's got to be consistent. It's got to be consistent and kiss. It's got to be keep it simple, stupid. It's got to be simple. You don't want to be constantly remembering or f forgetting steps. It should just be simple. Just be something natural that you can consistently do and you always remember. And finally, a, a mental program is going to be different for everybody, right? And Lanny, the one, the mental program that Lanny runs for shooting is going to be something different than if you're playing football or golf or, hell, if you're in a or you're in a sales position, right? So they're all going to vary somewhat. So what's what goes into a mental program? Well, there's there's a couple different things. There's these four different points. First one, point of initiation. This provides a clear start point to your mental program, right? And it's usually in the form of a physical cue. And this brings all your focus into the task that you're about to do. It, it's the engine. It, it's the spark. It's the spark that says, hey, Get ready because we're about to we're about to initialize here. We're about we're about to get off the line if this is a race. Next is a point of alignment. All right. So you, you come out of initiation, you have this clear start point, and you recognize that I'm about to perform this task. The point of alignment is where you align to the target, right? You you have to align your body ball, golf ball, football, volleyball, whatever, align it to the target. Where do you want this to go? Give me the direction that after everything initializes, this is where we want to go. All right. Then there's the point of direction. The direction, this is where you bring focus to the action you want to take. And you transition from what you want to do to actually doing it. All right, so this is what he was kind of talking about with that shift from conscious mind to the subconscious mind. Right? Or, or and, and you're still, well, I, let me backpedal here a second. You're still in your conscious phase, right? But... You're starting to transition to what you you want to do. You, you have like a visualization of, of what you want to do, what it's going to look like when you complete this task. Let me read from the book here. We want to narrow our focus and move toward the shot. This step occurs when the player looks at the chosen target. It is the middle part of the mental program and it brings the player into focus into the focus point of what they want to have happen and therefore reducing any negative thoughts in the conscious mind. So excuse me, I, I kind of had this a little bit off. It's You're not quite transitioning to the subconscious yet. That should be done in the task. But this is transitioning to visualizing what you want to happen. And again, this is all before... You, you you run your task or you 
embark on this on this shot on on the task on on whatever it is that you're about to embark on last thing here the point of focus this is the last thing you see before you take the action and this sets up the whole action and usually this comes in in the form of a phrase so you know if i'm using the golf example again that seems like a very natural example to use this could come in the form of a phrase so as soon as you start this phrase your body moves in to 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 the mode where you are using your subconscious taking the backswing back and completing the shot right so this can come in the form of a countdown three two one and then after one you know that after that that shot is happening laser focused and the main purpose of this is to reduce any negative thoughts that can occur before the player hits the ball that's the last thing you need right right before you're about to run this task that's the last thing you need let's continue on uh after this chapter we get into this is was the next chapter pressure chapter nine just a couple points on pressure this was a relatively relatively shorter shorter um chapter about pressure and these were just some some key points from here we are conditioned to think that pressure is a bad thing like we got to avoid pressure or stress i like to use the example of stress like we're, we're taught that stress is a bad thing like if you're if you're experiencing stress you shouldn't be experiencing that we saw this in man's search for meaning actually where Victor actually talks about how there's this constant need that that doctor, psychiatrist, psychologists put in us that hey, we should be if you're not happy, we need to do everything in our power right now to fix that because it's almost like you should always be happy. But that's not the case. No, you're going to feel bad sometimes cuz that's just part of life you can't be happy all the time and you use those bad moments and you dig yourself out of those bad moments to create more happiness it's it's in the journey from getting out of the gutter out of the sewer or or the low point that makes you happy but lanny here is kind of remarking uh, similar thoughts to what Victor did. You should not want or need to avoid pressure. It's something that you need to use. Right? It's inevitable. You're going to feel pressure. But the trick is not letting it overcome you. It's you overcoming it by using it to your advantage, not making it go away. Lanny says, if you want to control something, you have to understand it. Understand why you're facing this pressure. Well, it's a big competition. Maybe there's a, a rival on the other side, etc. The Once you like put a label on something, this is something that uh, Victor talked about in Man's Search for Meaning. Labeling has been used in negotiations. If you guys read uh, Chris Voss's book, and we we should do a series on that because that's a very good book. Um, how to negotiate like a, oh my gosh. No, never split the difference. Never split the difference. He talks about like labeling. Like when you're in a negotiation, labeling helps to just, you know, like you're labeling the emotions. It helps to just bring it out in the forefronts just so we all don't like misunderstand each other. So Lanny talks about pressure is two things at the same time, anxiety and tension. Well, what's anxiety? Anxiety is fear. It's a fear. How many people, I mean, have gone through anxiety? Probably a ton, right? Probably a lot. And fear can be overcome by experience. Once you have exposure to something and you see Oh, this isn't really that scary. 
then you overcome that fear. Then it, it, it no longer is a factor for you. And then pressure increases in direct proportion to your chances of winning. So slim chance of winning, not a lot of pressure. But you're expected to win? Oh, now you can't let anybody down, right? <laughs> that, that I mean, how many I've seen that in my life when you know, if I'm rolling with somebody in jiu-jitsu and it's somebody that like I should you know, have control over and handle, it's like, oh man, now I feel like I need to do this else now I look bad if I get tapped by somebody who's at a lower rank than me. You know, but if I'm rolling with a black belt, psh, you know, I, I, he's a black belt. I try different things. I have no expectations, so to speak. So anxiety, there's tension, which is your level of excitement, which is not a bad thing. Again, you should feel some tension. You should feel some anxiety. It's natural. I think I always thought that if you feel, it's good that you feel this sort of thing because it it means that you care. You care. You you're not. You don't want to be careless. We're going to talk about that in a second. You don't want to be careless, but you care. You're excited. There, it's a big moment. You're you're in this competition. It's not again. It's not a bad thing. You you need some little bit of tension to get you amped up and ready to perform. It's in at the end of the day, it's all about recognizing that pressure is something positive and you're in control of it. Your environment does not induce you, you should not induce you to have pressure. Don't let it do that to you. You are always in control. So Lanny uh, talks about some suggestions for matching your excitement level to your sport. He says, you know, number one, you can accept the advantages of stress as something you can take tr- control of. Use it to your advantage. To focus on what you want to see happen and not what is stressing you. So this kind of stems from keep uh, thinking about the outcomes instead of your own process, your own running, your own mental program, being consistent with it. Just focus on that. That's, that's all you should be focusing on. Don't focus on the outcome. Use a planned practice recovery strategy. This is so if something goes wrong or not as expected, you run this recovery strategy kind of like a mental program, and it gets you back in check. So he gives an example of one here. Breathe, then you relax a particular muscle group, and then you visualize, again, being in complete control of a good performance. Get that bad shot or whatever it was out of your head. You cannot reinforce that. This was interesting. He talked about faking a yawn, which causes, I guess there's scientific studies on if you fake a yawn, you know, it makes your body think like it's tired, so it causes muscles to relax. And then, you know, in turn, that causes you to relax. Just don't fall asleep. (laughs) And again, uh, pressure makes diamonds. Diamonds are a great thing, right? You need a little pressure when you're when you're mining, when you're deep in the earth. You get that little bit of pressure, just that right amount of pressure, and I'll pop we'll pop diamonds. And everybody loves diamonds, right? Next chapter was on the number one mental problem according to Lanny, is over-trying. And this is something that I think that I have struggled with in the past. And many activities just don't bode well when you give it your all. Case in point, me and programming and trying to, like, build an app. The harder I'm, like, the harder I'm into it, the more I become 
kind of one track minded and it's harder for me to see that there's other paths of uh, solving this problem. Right. You don't at that point, you don't I wouldn't want to give him my all and be hyper, hyper, hyper focused. on trying to build this app. No, you. You want things to just kind of naturally flow. You want to be relaxed. You want ideas to flow in your head. You want to be open. Right. And he talks about trying giving it your all versus trusting. And again, trusting the process. When you give it your all, I feel like then you're really giving it your all because you're trying to change the outcome, which again, you can't do. You can't control the outcome. But trusting in yourself, okay, and trusting in your process, very doable. That's within within our range. So why do competitors overtry? Well, Lanny talks about this. Most most of the time, they don't trust their subconscious skill set. They haven't. They just haven't practiced enough. You know, champions work hard in training. They work easy in competition. You know, in the competition, that should be a flow state. Watch any sprinter, Olympic sprinter, hundred meter dash. You think they're. Their their faces are like excruciating. They're like, oh, they're they're so tense. No, they're nice and relaxed, letting their arms flow. And I'm sure in training they're they're heavy lifting, they're they're doing starts out of the blocks. You know they're 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 running repeat two hundreds. You know they're they're working hard, so they can work easy in the competition. Competitors overtry because they think about the outcomes instead of the process. Again, we've we've mentioned this earlier. You can't think about two things at the same time. Focus on your own process. You can't control the outcome. And then lastly, they think the trying harder will produce a greater chance of success. And I can tell you it'll produce a greater chance of frustration because... You're going to try, try, try so hard and not see a linear relationship in the results from that. You know, it's it's not, it's going to be a logarithmic curve. So it's going to plateau at a certain point and you're going to think, oh, I'm just going to try harder. But you're just going to keep plateauing no matter how much harder you try. Once it gets to that certain point, you're going to become frustrated. Focus on the process. Focus on you. Not about anybody else. Not, a, not on the outcome. So here's where we, we talk about caring less. The solution, it's, it's not to care less. All right. Instead, you want to change what you care about. So you're focusing on the score, your scorecard, whatever. Instead, focus on the process. Focusing on the final result. Well, instead, just focus on the next step, your next shot, where you got to go to next. And there's the difference between competition and training. Competition is where you execute the process of performing. Training is where you master the steps of performing well. In the end, that's about having fun. If you're not, if you're not having fun, why? Why bother? Why are you out here doing it? You could be anywhere else. Have fun with it. Guys, thank you very much. If you made it this far, I really appreciate you listening. If you have any comments, please leave them in the comment session. Like and subscribe to my channel. I've got, um, we're going to get another video out of the bell curve next week and let me know what you think guys thank you so much this has been cheat my name is chris take care